Let me ask, uh, let me, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, our speaker and presenter, Dan Belknap, just for a second. D uh, Dan was born in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and raised in Pocatello, Idaho, and in Sandy, Utah. He served a full-time mission in the Pennsylvania Pittsburgh Mission, married Aaron Penny in 1997. They have four children, Emma, Jack, Samuel, and Tabitha. Dan received a bachelor's in international relations from BYU and a master's in ancient and near eastern studies from BYU and a master's and a doctorate degree from Northwest Semitics from, uh, from the University of Chicago. He worked as a part-time instructor become, before becoming an assistant professor here at BYU in 2007 and then advanced to the rank of professor in 2020. Uh, Dan has a lot of uh, areas of interest, including cultural and sociological influences in the Book of Mormon, the use of ritual in ancient and, and, and contemporary context, doctrines of ascension and theosis in ancient Near East and late antiquity, and comparative cosmologies. Does that just blow your mind? <laughs> Dan, I don't even know what I just read, but uh, thank you so much. I, uh, I'm grateful to be on this faculty uh, with Dan Belknap. Dan, Dan, Belknap. Dan uh, always has struck me as one who loves the Lord and is passionate about the gospel, and it's a great blessing for us to be here uh, with him tonight. So Dan, it's all yours. Uh, Mark, thank you very much for that. Um, I hope you don't mind, I've got a tissue. I'm recovering from a bit of a head cold, so that shouldn't be an issue, though every now and then I might end up sniffling. So. I apologize to that at the beginning. The culminating event of the Book of Mormon, uh, the fulfillment of 600 years of Nephi prophecy, was Christ's post-resurrection physical ministry. Comprising chapters 11 through 18 of 3rd Nephi, the first day of that ministry is described in great detail, incorporating a number of teachings and events reflecting the supernal nature of that day. Much has been written concerning the discourses and experiences of that first day. Yet perhaps the most intriguing are those of events associated with touch with Christ's ministry, beginning with an initial touching event described in 3rd Nephi 11, verses 14 and 15, and the day's ministry ending with an allusion to that earlier event in 3rd Nephi 18, verse 25. And ye see that I have commanded that none of you should go away, but rather have commanded that you should come unto me, that you might feel and see. This continuity suggests that touch was not peripheral, not just peripheral to his ministry, but central to it. In fact, touch appears to have been used by Christ as a form of teaching, with Christ himself declaring that touching him would result in knowing that he was, quote, the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth and have been slain for the sins of the world. Yet touching Christ may have done more than what Christ explicitly said it would do. For the act of touching itself can be understood as a form of communication with physiological effects such as engendering social cohesiveness that communicate meaning even if one's touching, even if the ones touching are not aware of it. My presentation will explore the role of touch in Christ's first day ministry, beginning with the manner by which touching Christ taught what he said it would, thus possibly confirming uncertainty in Nephite prophecy to that point, and then addressing the ways touch may have affected other aspects of his first day ministry, concluding with new insight into Christ's invitation to come unto me at the conclusion of that day's ministry. According to Mormon, following Christ's condescension from heaven, the multitude, quote, fell to the earth, thus associating their behavior with their recognition of the fulfillment of prophecy, quote. The whole multitude fell to the earth, for they remembered that it had been prophesied among them that Christ should show himself unto them after his ascension into heaven. At this point, Christ exhorted those assembled to arise and come forth unto me that ye may thrust your hands into my side, and also that ye may feel the prints of the nails in my hands and in my feet, that ye may know that I am the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth and have been slain for the sins of the world. Mormon then recounts that everyone did so. 
going, quote, going forth one by one until they had all gone forth and did see with their eyes and did feel with their hands and did know of a surety and did bear record that it was he of whom it was written by the prophets that should come. As these verses suggest, a primary purpose to this initial touching event was to acquire knowledge, specifically the knowledge that Christ was the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth, and that he had been slain for the sins of the world. Though verse 12 implies that the gathered recognized Christ upon his arrival, a closer reading may indicate that they did not do so immediately. Only after Christ introduced himself using the language he had spoken during the three days of darkness did Mormon place their remembrance of the earlier prophecy. A prophecy, interestingly, is not mentioned anywhere else in the Book of Mormon. Their initial uncertainty and Christ's emphasis that touching him would give them knowledge that he was the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth and had been slain for the sins of the world may indicate ignorance of three things. One, Christ's death by crucifixion. Two, that he would visit those in the new world. And three, that Christ was in fact God, thus necessitating the acquisition of this knowledge by those gathered in Bountiful via touching the Savior. Let's look at each one of these. The first one, uncertainty concerning death by crucifixion. <laughs> Understanding that Christ died by crucifixion would appear at first glance to be obvious. The physical puncture marks associated with crucifixion clearly and tangibly present on Christ's body and attesting to the and, and attested to the act of crucifixion. Yet it is possible that Christ's crucifixion and crucifixion in general was not widely understood by the survivors of the cataclysm events described in 3 Nephi 8 through 10. The understanding that Christ was going to die to redeem the world can be found as late as the prophecies of Samuel the Lamanite, who noted that Christ, quote, surely must die that salvation may come, that thereby men may be brought into the presence of the Lord. Yet explicit references to crucifixion are found primarily in the prophecies associated with the small plates. The first explicit reference to the crucifixion is in Nephi's paraphrase of certain prophecies found on the brass plates. Quote, the God of our fathers, yea, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and the God of Jacob, yieldeth himself as a man into the hands of wicked men to be lifted up according to the words of Zenic and to be crucified according to the words of Nahum. A few verses later, Nephi again referenced crucifixion, this time suggesting that the prophet Zenos also prophesied of Christ's crucifixion. Jacob referenced the crucifixion in his discourse recorded in 2 Nephi 6 through 10. In 2 Nephi 6 verse 9, Jacob proclaimed, the Lord has shown unto me that the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, should manifest himself unto them in the flesh. And after he shall manifest himself, they shall scourge him and crucify him, according to the words of the angel who spake it unto me. Jacob repeated the prophecy in 2 Nephi 10, verse 3, again highlighting the prophecy's angelic origin. And they shall crucify him, for thus it behoveth our God, and there is none other nation on earth that would crucify their God. Nephi gave one last prophecy concerning Christ's crucifixion following his Isaiah citations, declaring that the Jews would, quote, crucify him, and after he was laid in a sepulcher for the space of three days, he shall rise from the dead. After these references, there is no explicit mention of crucifixion until the Nephite migration to Zarahemla. The next set of prophecies are found in King Benjamin's discourse, also delivered angelically. Quote, the things which I shall tell you are made known unto me by an angel from God. And he said, they shall consider him a man and say that he hath the devil, and they shall scourge him and shall crucify him. The final explicit reference is in the words of Abinadi, who noted that Christ would be, quote, crucified and slain, the flesh becoming subject even unto death, the will of the Son being swallowed up in the will of the Father. This is, as I have said, the last explicit reference to the crucifixion until Christ's appearance. 
And it may suggest that the few generations preceding Christ's arrival were unaware of the act and it being a means by which one could identify Christ. In fact, the nature of the act itself may have been unknown outside of vision or direct angelic speech, as there is no indication that Roman-style crucifixion was practiced in the New World anywhere. The only individual who appears to have seen the crucifixion was Nephi, who stated in his vision that he had seen Christ lifted up. Others were told that he would be lifted up, but there is no corresponding vision provided. Therefore, it is unclear if the people understood what crucifixion even was at the time of Christ's arrival. Second one, uncertainty concerning Christ's coming. It is also unclear how well known were prophecies concerning Christ's actual appearance in the New World. Prophecies concerning the coming of Christ as a mortal are found throughout the Book of Mormon. In fact, it is possible that this is one of the most common prophecies in the Nephi record. First noted in 1 Nephi 11, verse 7, these prophecies continue until 3 Nephi chapter 2, verse 7, and range from simple observations that Christ would come to detailed prophecies concerning his birth and ministry. The designations associated with Christ's mortality include his identification as the Messiah, the Son of God, Lamb of God, Redeemer, Christ, and importantly for this paper, Lord and God. The latter are significant as they indicate the prophecy that God would take on a mortal form was understood among at least some of the righteous. Yet as common as these prophecies are, they emphasized Christ's birth and ministry in the Old World. Prophecies declaring Christ's ministry in the New World are rare in the text as we have it. The most explicit prophecies are again found in the writings of 1 Nephi, or in Nephi, Nephi 1. As part of the vision concerning his descendants and after destruction associated with Christ's death, he saw, quote, the heavens open and the Lamb of God descending out of heaven. And he came down and showed himself, unquote, to those who survived. Nephi revisits the prophecy in 2 Nephi 26, verse 1, noting, quote, After Christ shall have risen from the dead, he shall show himself unto you, my children and my beloved brethren. Reiterating the destruction that would take place at Christ's death, Nephi then promises, the son of righteousness shall appear unto them, the righteous who should survive, and he shall heal them, and they shall have peace with him. In both instances, Nephi appears to be addressing later generations of Lehi's descendants who would experience Christ's visit. But the placement of these prophecies on the small plates may suggest they were not well known by later generations. Alma also spoke of Christ's coming. For instance, Alma would tell his son Corianton that their ministry was, quote, to declare these glad tidings, the coming of Christ, unto this people to prepare their minds, or rather that salvation might come unto them, that they might prepare the minds of their children to hear the word at the time of his coming. A generation or two later, Helaman would remind his sons, Nephi and Lehi, of King Benjamin's prophecy, paraphrasing, Jesus Christ, who shall come, yea, remember that he cometh to redeem the world. Nephi, his son, would later declare that the Nephi, quote, fathers, even down to this time, yea, they have testified of the coming of Christ. Significantly, though, these prophecies only indicate an awareness that Christ was coming to earth to redeem it, not explicit prophecies concerning a visitation by him to those in the New World. An explicit reference to Christ's coming to the New World, following Nephi, is found in Alma 16, verse 20. The verse is part of Mormon's summary of events for the latter half of the 12th year of the reign of the judges. In response to the ministering of the church's priests, quote, many of the people did inquire concerning the place where the Son of God should come. 
the interest appears to be based on the church's teachings, described a few verses earlier. Quote, the Lord did pour out his spirit on all the face of the land to prepare the minds of the children of men or to prepare their hearts to receive the word which would be taught among them at the time of his coming. As noted, the coming of Christ as a mortal was a common Book of Mormon prophecy. This continued as part of the church's teachings in the reign of the Judges, possibly reflecting the emphasis of the Benedite's teachings in the early church. Mormon continues in Alma 1620, noting the people were, quote, taught that Christ would appear unto them after his resurrection, and that this people did hear with great joy, this the people did hear with great joy and gladness thus suggesting that Christ's future appearance was, in fact, a known element of the church's teachings. Yet, three years earlier, in the ninth year of the reign of the judges, Alma, speaking to the people of Gideon, admitted, quote, the time is not far distant that the Redeemer liveth and cometh among his people. Behold, I do not say that he will come among us at the time of the, his dwelling in his mortal tabernacle. For behold, the Spirit hath not said to me that this should be the case. Now, as to this thing, I do not know that the Lord God hath power to do all things which are according to his word. According to the admission, Alma acknowledges or seems to acknowledge two things. One, the first is that he knows Christ will visit his people, whoever his people are. And that the second is that Christ would not be in the new world during his, quote, time of dwelling. The assumption as to whom his people are appears to be the church in the Book of Mormon. But if this is the case, then Alma is acknowledging that he's unsure exactly how the prophecy would be filled among them. His own uncertainty reflected in the admission. Perhaps most notable, is the absence of this prophecy or any prophecy like it in the prophecies attributed to the Samuel Lamanite. As detailed as they were about the events that would take place in the new world at the birth and death of Christ, Samuel's prophecies significantly contain no explicit reference or even allusion to Christ's arrival in the new world. In light of this, it is possible that those gathered as described in 3 Nephi 11 were not fully aware that Christ was to come and visit them personally. Three, uncertainty concerning Christ as God. This final uncertainty mentioned above and throughout was the way Christ could also be identified as God. At issue was what the Nephites meant when they spoke of Christ as both the Son of God and God. The identification for Christ as the Son of God is found 51 times in the Book of Mormon. The first mention is in 1 Nephi 10, verse 17, where Lehi described Christ as the Son of God. The designation is found four times in Nephi's vision, with the angel also identifying Christ as the Lamb of God, who he later acknowledges as the Son of the everlasting God and the Son of the Eternal Father. Later, in 2 Nephi chapter 25, Nephi uses the designation twice in conjunction with the only begotten of the Father. The text of King Benjamin's sermon contains the title three times, the first usage as in 1 Nephi 11, used by an angel. Alma also uses the designation. In fact, he uses the designation 18 times, more than any other, with its appearance in every major sermon he delivered. The designation is used once by Helaman when speaking to his sons, Nephi and Lehi, with his son, Nephi, using it three times in his Sermon on the Tower. Samuel the Lamanite references Christ as the Son of God three times in Helaman 14. Of interest is that the usage of the title by those who are critical of the church's teachings in Helaman 16, verse 18, quote, it is not reasonable that such a being as a Christ should come. If so, and he be the Son of God, the Father of heaven and earth. Though antagonistic, its usage here suggests a general understanding among the population as to Christ as the Son of God. One final note before moving on 
is that this designation is often associated with Christ's future mortal state, that he would take upon himself a body and thus was the Son of God. In fact, in at least two instances, Mosiah 15 verse 3 and 3 Nephi 1 verse 14, Christ's designation of Son is explicitly tied to his future physical form. Further prophetic utterances demonstrate that they distinguish between Christ and a figure identified as God, even when not using the explicit designation of Son of God. In 2 Nephi 25, verse 23, Nephi exhorts his people to believe in Christ and be reconciled unto God. In Nephi's discourse concerning the eventual restoration of Israel, he notes, the Lord covenanteth with none, save it be with them that repent and believe in his Son, who is the Holy One of Israel. Nephi's brother Jacob also suggests that it was understood that these were two distinct and different divine beings, Son and God. In Jacob chapter 4, verse 5, Jacob records that he and his people, quote, believed in Christ and worshiped the Father in his name. Just a few verses later, Jacob would exhort his people to, quote, be reconciled unto him, God, through the atonement of Christ, his only begotten Son. As with the designation of Christ as Son of God, these references indicate a common understanding of Christ as a being separate from, quote-unquote, God. Yet even as these descriptions suggest that Christ and God were understood as two distinct beings, other references imply a more complex, ambiguous understanding to the designation of the term God and its application to Christ. In 1 Nephi 19, Nephi indicates that the, quote, God of our fathers, the God of Abraham and of Isaac, and the God of Jacob would be crucified, indicating that Christ was also God. In 2 Nephi chapter 10, verses 3 and 4, Jacob explicitly designates Christ as God, who would be crucified and work miracles. A few chapters later, Nephi would entitle Christ as the eternal God. A few hundred years later, Abinadi emphasized that, quote, God would come down. This emphasis on divine condescension being one of the primary factors behind Abinadi's martyrdom, quote, for thou hast said that God himself should come down among the children of men. In at least one instance, the divine voice identifying himself as Christ refers to himself as God. In Mosiah 26, which records the revelation setting out the church's regulations concerning membership, the divine voice declares, quote, This is my church, whomsoever ye receive and shall believe in my name, and him will I freely forgive. For it is I that taketh upon me the sins of the world. Then shall they know that I am their Lord, that I am the Lord, their God, that I am their Redeemer. A duality, then, between the usage of the term God as a general term for divinity and as a designation for a specific entity. This is expressed in Alma 11. Part of the debate between Zeezrom and Amulek centers on this subject. In verse 25, Amulek referenced, quote, the true and living God. After confirming this title, Zeezrom then asks if there is more than one God, implying that he understood Amulek to be discussing the title as the designation for a type of divine being. Amulek's answer is no, suggesting that his usage differed from what Zeezrom supposed. A few verses later, Zeezrom asks concerning the prophecy of Christ, who is he that should come? Is it the son of God? Amulek answers in the affirmative, to which Zeezrom then rejoins with, Ah, look, he saith there is but one God, yet he saith that the Son of God shall come. Which suggests that at some level, the phrase Son of God was equated with the concept of God, since Zeezrom is attempting to catch Amulek in a verbal error. The subject is redressed again later in the confrontation with Zeezrom asking if the Son of God was, quote, the very eternal Father. 
Anarch responded again in the affirmative, noting that this individual would, quote, come into the world to redeem his people, an act that would allow for a judgment and resurrection, by which all would be, quote, brought and arraigned before the bar of Christ the Son and God the Father and the Holy Spirit, which is one eternal God. In this verse, three usages of God are being used. God as entity is referenced in conjunction with the identification of the Father, while the entities of Christ, the Father, and the Holy Ghost are one eternal God. I think it's just repeated here, sorry about that. Thus there appears to be three concurrent usages of God. One, God in reference to an individual entity, often but not always associated with the supreme deity, equated either with God the Father, especially when used to designate Christ as Son or with Christ. Two, the term God is used as an ontological descriptor, that's your vocab word for the night, <laughs> in which no specific identity is necessarily referenced, but purposes and behaviors of deity may include recognizing the deity's possible physical form. Three, the term God is used as a designation for organization of divine entities, or what today we would refer to as the Godhead. Adding to the confusion, it appears that at some point the Nephite word God was not understood by the Lamanites. In Alma 13, the martial acts of Ammon, that's the cutting off of the arms, are ascribed to supernatural power, which leads Lamoni, the Lamanite king, to assume that Ammon is, quote, the great spirit, a deity. Later, when Ammon demonstrates that he knows what Lamoni is thinking, Lamoni again equates him with the great spirit, quote, who art thou? Art thou that great spirit who knoweth all things? Still later, though, when Ammon asks if Lamoni believes in God, Lamoni's answer is intriguing. I do not know what that meaneth. Suggesting that the terminology Ammon is using, translated in the Book of Mormon as God, is not in the Lamanite lexicon, or has a completely different meaning. Ammon then asks if Lamoni believes there is a, quote, great spirit. When Lamoni responds in the affirmative, Ammon declares, this is God. The same confusion appears later in Aaron's interaction with Lamoni's father. The exchange begins with Lamoni's father wondering why it is that Ammon is not present. Aaron's response is that Ammon has been called away to the land of Ishmael by the spirit of the Lord. Lamoni's father then asks, what is this that you've said concerning the spirit of the Lord? Hold. This is a thing which doth trouble me. What exactly it is that troubles him is not clear. Though, based on the confusion between the Nephite term God and the Lamanite term Great Spirit, it is possible that Lamoni's father is confused as to who is exactly interacting with Ammon. Aaron's response to this begins in the same manner as Ammon with Lamoni. Believest thou that there is a God? Unlike Lamoni, who responded that he didn't know what that, that meant, Lamoni's father answers that he is aware of God, but only through Nephite dissenters, to whom he has granted religious rites of assembly and building of edifices. This awareness leads Lamoni's father to ask whether the Nephite God is the equivalent to his great spirit. And like his brother, Aaron responds in the affirmative. What these narratives suggest is that the Nephite terminology for deity is perhaps not the same as the Lamanite terminology, and that therefore the nature of God was not equally known among Lehi's descendants. As to how they envisioned what a God was as a physical entity is never explicitly defined in the Book of Mormon. Whether God the Father had a body is not once found there. Christ is accorded a physical body, but only when he becomes mortal. For the Lamanites, deity, or at least a chief deity, was understood to be a great spirit, 
And though the terminology differed, all Nephite interactions with Christ in the Book of Mormon would have been with him in his pre-mortal, pre-corporeal state, and thus a spirit as well. His designation as son reflecting his future corporeal state. The ontological nature of other individuals identified as God are either as spirit or not provided. Thus, not surprisingly, the Holy Ghost or Spirit of God is designated as a spirit. But in the case of God the Father and his ontological state, the text is silent. Again, as noted above, it seems clear the Nephites know of the existence of the Father as an independent entity and recognize generally his work regarding salvation. But there is no explicit interaction with God the Father outside of 2 Nephi 31 prior to 3 Nephi. And as to 2 Nephi 31, that records speech from both God the Father and Christ to Nephi. Thus, it is unclear if anyone in the Book of Mormon in 3 Nephi fully understood the ontological nature of God outside of spirit states, with the Lamanites possibly not even understanding the very terminology. These uncertainties, uncertainties as to the fulfillment of earlier Nephite prophecy, specifically prophecies concerning crucifixion and his actual appearance in the new world, as well as uncertainty concerning how Christ was God and if gods had bodies, may have been answered in the touching experience. Unfortunately, Christ does not explain, nor Mormon for that matter, how exactly touching Christ was necessary for the acquisition of this knowledge. With that said, tactile man manipulation is one of the pri primary avenues for early learning. Though rarely thought of in terms of the learning process, specifically abstract learning, tactile or haptic learning is formational at the beginning of the learning process. While haptic learning is crucial to spatial awareness, which includes such elements as temperature, air movement, object recognition, even balance, it also serves to make that which is abstract concrete. In little children and infants, some have suggested that approximately 60% of the early lexical development is simple nouns. This development begins with the child grasping and feeling the object. The act of touching creates rudimentary patterns of mental characteristics, which are the foundation of the much more complex mental representations. The haptic schemas, or the patterns or characteristics associated with the object, then allow for them to lead to image schemas, in which the visual experience with the object harmonizes with the haptic or tactile memory. The, these then allow for the object to be associated with a more abstract identifying word. For example, a child may first learn the concept of apple through the touch of one which is reinforced by a picture of one, which is then finally assigned the abstract word, apple. In the end, the child knows what an apple is and will associate the correct concept when presented with the word apple. But the process itself began with the tactile manipulation of one. In this manner, Helen Keller was able to figure out how to communicate. It took her hands being placed under running water and then having her fingers manipulated tactically into the signs for water, which she felt tactically, that she was finally able to grasp the concept of water. That was the communicative breakthrough that she needed. It was the tactile experience, the sense of touch, the water running over her skin that led to the mental recognition. Based on the role of touch in learning, it is possible that the experience of touching Christ reinforced schema that had already existed, such as the Nephite prophecies, while at the same time making concrete other schema, like the physical reality of a god. The experience itself would have entailed sensations such as pressure, temperature distribution, spatiality, and so forth, all of which would have revealed something about the nature of the object being touched. If, as Christ says, the object was his divinized body, then touch was being used to make aspects of a divine body concrete. This may seem elementary, 
but it has profound implications concerning the uncertainties mentioned above. First, it would have confirmed the nature of crucifixion. As noted earlier, there is no evidence that Nephites, that earlier Nephites and the righteous who were present at Christ's arrival understood exactly what crucifixion entailed. But running fingers over the ridges and indentations of Christ's smarts in his hands and in his feet would have initiated haptic learning, allowing for everyone present to grasp what crucifixion was, which would have led to a greater understanding and appreciation of those prophecies. They would have truly understood what had been promised. Second, it would have confirmed the prophecies of Christ's coming and of his presence. This may seem obvious, but by handling and feeling Christ's body, those gathered would no longer have simply believed but known in a powerful, lasting way that Christ was real. That this is in fact what happened is realized in their response to the touching recorded by Mormon. Quote, and this they did do, going forth one by one until they had all gone forth and did feel with their hands and did know of a surety that it was he of whom it was written by the prophets that should come. Finally, the experience of touching Christ would have taught those gathered the physical reality of a divine body. Again, as obvious as it may sound, it would have revealed the spatial immediacy of Christ. A divine body takes up space. It was present within a space that is not filled by anything else. He would have confirmed that deity had its own physical form independent of others. In this, it would have contrasted with deity as spirit. The ontological implications of a spirit being were that they could be housed or embodied in anything, perhaps suggesting a fluidity to the concept of God. Feeling Christ's own body, though, would have established that at least some level, the term or concept God includes an independent physical form. This experience would have affected that understanding from that moment forward. It would have confirmed that the body of God was a living body. While it is not clear exactly what a resurrected body is like, does it have a pulse? Does it even have a circulatory system? Does one breathe? Any of those questions. It's certainly not a corpse. Thus, his body would have been enlivened, possibly reacting to the stimuli of being touched by twitching, shivering, or so forth. All of this would have confirmed his living nature, that deity was alive and therefore relatable at some level. Those gathered would know via the haptic learning the nature and very existence of deity. As Christ himself would recognize, you have seen me and know that I am. Though the tactile experience described in 3 Nephi 11 had an explicit purpose to teach those gathered about Christ, both in terms of prophecies uttered about him and his very ontological nature as God, the experience would have had other unspoken effects as well by virtue, uh, other, unspoke, sorry, other unspoken effects as well by virtue of the physiological aspect of the event. Perhaps the most significant would have been the hormonal changes enacted by the active form of touching, specifically the release of oxytocin. This physiological effect of touch has long been recognized and been noted uh, to be an essential feature of social interaction. First noted as an effect of childbirth and labor, breastfeeding and physical intimacy, oxytocin has since been found to, released in, to be released in even the most casual touch such as handshakes, pats on the back, and so forth. While there is still much that is not known about the effects of oxytocin, one of the primary effects of oxytocin appears to reduce the amygdala activity, an area of the brain that regulates fear and aggression, and the release of hormones such as cortisol, which is associated with stress and anxiety. At the same time, it helps facilitate the release of other hormones, such as dopamine 
and serotonin, which have calming influences and are associated with pro-social behavior, such as creation and maintenance of long-term bonds, parental care, and other social, other social affiliations. One of the intriguing outcomes of touch is that it appears the release of oxytocin associated with touch increases compliancy in those being touched. In one study, it was demonstrated that a waiter or waitress who touched a restaurant patron, even in the most casual manner, was more likely to receive a bigger tip. <laughs> Other studies have demonstrated that oxytocin makes one more socially aware, with one study noting that the presence of oxytocin led to greater visual concentration of another's eyes and facial expressions. In light of the pro-social behavior that results from oxytocin, some have begun noting that oxytocin may play a role in one's spirituality and religiosity. Perhaps because touch has such a powerful physiological impact, touch experiences are highly regulated socially. No matter the culture, bodily contact is often limited to only certain situations, and the type of touch is associated with one's own spatiality. One's understanding of self includes the physical separateness one has from objects and others, with the senses delineating the type of contact one has with another. Unlike the other senses, touch possesses an immediacy in terms of response. Unlike the other senses, touch includes an immediate awareness of being touched. One cannot be unaware of touch the same way one can be unaware of others looking at us. Touch collapses personal space, and it's not an event that one remains unaware of. As such, touch is one of the primary means of communication. The space that separates us from others, and thus regulates the type of touching that can take place, demarcates the closeness of the individual with us. The more physically distant and non-touching, the less attached we are to the individual. The closer they are to our actual body, the more they touch us, the more likely we have attachment feelings to the individual. The closer they are, the more they're allowed to touch and have access to more places to touch. Thus, not surprisingly, touch plays a role in determining social status. In a number of studies, initiation of touch seems to indicate one is of a higher social status, with the act elevating the individual in the lower status since the act suggests access to higher social levels, as if some of the status was rubbed off and is retained by the individual of lower status. Other studies have demonstrated that because touch indicates status, the type of touch differs in those of higher and lower social status. Those in lower status positions are more likely to initiate touching, but engage in more formal, polite touches, such as handshakes, that recognize and maintain spatial distance. Those of higher status are more likely to engage in more informal, friendly acts of touch, such as hand to shoulder and hand to arm. Because the type of touch is significant as much as the act of touching itself, the, it is worth noting the terminology used to describe the touch type in 3rd Nephi 11. We are told that the individual was to, quote, thrust their hands, plural into the side of Christ and feel the prints of the nails in his hands and his feet. These suggest a tactile experience, which would have included feeling the ridges, the puckering of skin, pressure in or on the body, perhaps feeling the depressions or absence of flesh in the wounds themselves, sensing the warmth of the flesh. In the case of the spear mark, one would have also felt flesh surrounding the fingers that had been inserted into the wound. If the above description of the tactile experience is somewhat uncomfortable to you right now, part of the reaction reflects the intimacy of the act itself. This was not simply a reaching out of a fingertip, but fully active form of touching of areas of the bodily body associated with intimate space and normally off limits, particularly the lower torso. 
who do you let touch this part of your body? The social boundaries are not in effect with Christ and therefore result in our potentially reflexive discomfort. In this sense, then, we can think of Christ's invitation as a provocative one. It certainly would have had social ramifications. In terms of status, Christ's invitation indicates his position of higher status. Yet the type of touch is not one of social distance, but of intimacy and closeness, in which those gathered entered Christ's personal, even intimate space and engaged in more than incidental polite contact. They were invited not only to actively feel the contours and depressions of the marks, but actually to place their hands inside the body of Christ in an area, either the torso or lower torso, that is commonly restricted territory. Moreover, there is no record that Christ actively touched back. Instead, Christ stood there as 2,500 people ran their hands over portions of his body, inserting them into his side. The invitation to enter his personal intimate space suggests a reversal of status. Christ voluntarily placed himself into the lower status position regarding this touching event, elevating all who actively touched him, in effect erasing the concept of status as a marker. The closeness and the type and placement of the touching indicated that Christ did not view those touching as strangers, but close intimate friends or colleagues. The effects, both in terms of the physiological effects and the resulting pro-social behavior, may provide insight into Christ's emphases concerning social cohesion. Christ's instructions to the disciples concerning the proper manner of baptism immediately following the touching event include instruction that there should be, quote, no disputations among the congregation. In verses 29 and 30, Christ teaches that there should be no contention and anger against any one other in any situation with Christ suggesting such antisocial behavior is the antithesis of his doctrine. Quote, this is not my doctrine, to stir up the hearts of men with anger one against another. But this is my doctrine, that such things should be done away. This is immediately followed by Christ's emphasis on the oneness that exists between him and other members of the Godhead. Similar instruction is given to the multitude. While many have recognized themes in Christ's sermon at the temple, noting its similarities with Christ's old world teachings, social cohesion plays a role in these as well. Third Nephi chapter 12, verses 11 and 12, speak to the importance of not responding in kind to negative social behaviors, as do verses 38 through 44, emphasizing the role of loving even your enemy, praying for those that despise and persecute you. Earlier, in verses 21 through 25, Christ again had emphasized the role of reconciliation in proper worship, exhorting those gathered to, quote, go thy way unto thy brother and first be reconciled, if they desire to come unto Christ. Christ's instruction concerning marriage in verses 27 and 32 may also be seen as an emphasis to greater cohesion, this time within the bonds of the marriage relationship. Later in the day, oneness is again a theme. Beginning in chapter 15, Christ relates that there are, quote, other sheep which I have, which are not in this fold. These two would receive Christ's ministrations so that there would be, quote, one fold and one shepherd. This is emphasized in verses 21, where Christ indicates that the righteous in the new world were those of whom he was speaking, again emphasizing the importance of one fold and one shepherd. Chapter 16 continues the theme, this time noting that there were still others that Christ would minister to, again, because there was to be one fold and one shepherd. Within this context of greater social cohesion established by the touching event, we place Christ's teachings on the gathering. Immediately following his emphasis on one fold and one shepherd, itself following on the heels of his teachings that implied oneness among the gathered and bountiful, Christ speaks concerning the manner by which he and the Father would gather all, both Israelite and Gentile, placing the pivotal Isianic prophecy concerning redemption and comfort within the context of the touching event and social cohesion of his earlier words. The event described in 3 Nephi 11 was not the only tactile event of the day. Following his spoken discourses, Christ had brought to him all who were, quote, afflicted in any manner, who were then healed. We don't know precisely how the healing took place, but Christ suggested that he would do so in the same manner as he did in the old world. Quote, I perceive that you desire that I should show unto you what I've done unto your brethren in Jerusalem. If he did heal in the same manner, this would have included touch touching the afflicted, as this is the overwhelmingly predominant way he healed in the New Testament. 
A few verses later, we find that Christ invited all the little children into the gathering to come to him, where, following a prayer concerning all who had gathered, Christ, quote, took their little children one by one and blessed them. Again, though it doesn't say explicitly that he touched them, the implication of his taking them one by one suggests that he would have held them, perhaps encircling them with his arms while blessing them, while at the same time reflecting the earlier experience. Just as they had come one by one to touch him, so he too touched them one by one. These later events would have had the same physiological results and thus would have emphasized and reinforced the effects of the earlier event, resulting in even greater social cohesion. The reciprocal acts of touch, those gathered touching Christ and then Christ touching them, strengthening and adding layer upon layer to those relationships. The initial touching event also played a role in Christ's introduction of the sacrament and the instruction concerning his church recorded in 30 by 18. After establishing the way the bread of the sacrament would be dispersed and eaten, Christ noted that it should be done in, quote, remembrance of my body, which I have shown unto you. Thus, one element of the new ordinance experience was to remember the experience they had with Christ's <laughs> body. For those gathered, the sacrament would remind not only of Christ's sacrifice, but also his resurrected tangible body. It had been a reminder that he was there. Therefore, one aspect of the event was to be a specific memory to be used in later spiritual growth. This aspect of the memory, the memory of it, is explicit in Christ's later instruction. Beginning in 3 Nephi 18, verse 22, after noting the righteous should meet together oft, no one should be forbidden from meeting with the congregation. You shall not forbid any man from coming unto you when ye shall meet together. You shall pray for them and shall not cast them out. Why would one do so? Because Christ himself had set the example. Ye see that I have commanded that none of you should go away, but rather have commanded that you should come unto me. This is then followed by a direct reference to the event and an exhortation to do likewise. That you should come unto me, that you might feel and see, even so shall you do unto the world. That last clause, even so shall you do unto the world, is beautifully ambiguous. What is it exactly that those gathered were to do? On one level, it appears that they were to bring people to Christ much as he had brought those gathered to him. In other words, they, having experienced Christ, would now go and invite others to come unto him. Doing so may be reflected in something as simple as a handshake or a pat on the back, a physical act that demonstrates to the one touched that they are being thought of and known, that they belong and are valued. Yet it is equally possible that Christ's request is not alluding to the act of physical touch, but instead to an individual making themselves as available, as open, as vulnerable, demonstrating the same willingness to be vulnerable and receptive of others as Christ himself had been. Or perhaps it was both. Both a request that invites others to the supernal knowledge that we ourselves know concerning Christ and the willingness to make ourselves as open and invulnerable as Christ himself was. However we're to understand this commandment, it arises from the powerful experience of touch. It was through touching and being touched that those gathered that day in Bountiful truly knew that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of centuries of prophecy, that he was the God who died and was resurrected, not just for those present, but to all humanity. It was through touch that physiological effects could take place, reinforcing Christ's teachings concerning unity and oneness. It was through the experience of touch that the new ordinance of sacrament was introduced. It was the memory of that touch that led to Christ's supernal and open-ended invitation to do unto the world. Even as we recognize the significance of Christ's spoken teachings, perhaps it is through the unspoken acts of touch that Christ's most significant teaching took place. Certainly, its power resonates with us today. His invitation is real now, as it was on that day in Bountiful. Thank you. <laughs>